Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. I'm Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on YouTube. All right, today's video comes from our patrons actually um, because they voted on it this week. And what they chose was the hoax that won the Cold War by Unknown Five. So that's an interesting topic. Uh, Cold War has kind of been a popular topic of discussion right now. I noticed a lot of the young people are very interested in it. Um, kind of the ideas of, of, of communism and kind of been fascinated by that and that whole sort of uh, relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. So I'm guessing from this one, um, this hoax probably perpetuated by the United States since they said it's what won the Cold War. So that should be interesting to check out. By the way, if you are into the Cold War and into video games and maybe you've been uh, around recently for on the eve of the um, release of Call of Duty uh, Cold War. That's something I uh, was playing the beta on and will probably play when it comes out. And if that's something you would like to see me play, uh, a couple things you can do. You can sub to the Mr. Terry Gaming channel. A link is down below. Or if you prefer to watch on Twitch, we have a newly created Twitch channel. It's just called Mr. Terry History and there's a link down below. And that's where I think where you'll see some gameplay of that. So if you're into that, Make sure you sub to those. Now, the original video link will be down below, so make sure that you give that a view, like, subscribe. And if you haven't liked my video, I'd love to have you do that too, and it uh, really helps the channel. And if you haven't subbed, I'd like to have you around as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started. On the 23rd of March 1983, Reagan. President Reagan delivered an now famous but at the time somewhat unusual televised address to the American people that the media mockingly labelled as the Star Wars speech. This broadcast announced to the watching world that the United States was actively working on what, even in the present day, sounds like incredibly futuristic technology, but at the time sounded like something out of a science fiction movie. Just the whole Star Wars thing, as they called it? They're going to build some kind of uh, defense system against, like, uh, uh, atomic bombs, like stuff in space that would shoot down, you know, uh, atomic weapons being launched. That was an interesting concept. The president directly called upon the scientific community to develop a new missile defense system that was officially known as the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI for short, which would in effect render nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Yeah by using an assortment of fantastical sounding technologies yeah. such as lasers, particle beams, and <laughs> railguns to shoot down nuclear missiles after they were launched. Yeah, they, they kind of, people nicknamed this Star Wars because it was like they were going to be taking weaponization into space. And this was in 1983, so this was at the peak of the, uh, uh, the Star Wars trilogy as it was kind of wrapping up, uh, getting ready to wrap up. And yeah, the technology sound like something out of a movie. Now this never happens. Never as created. It was. A, it required a technology that was not even close. But I wonder. My hypothesis. I wonder is that they like the idea of this was something that maybe the Soviets took seriously and helped that way. Safely destroying them in space before they could reach their targets. Finally ending the terrifying threat of nuclear Armageddon and ushering in a new era of world peace in the process. Yet while such a goal seems praiseworthy, this proposed missile defense system had one major flaw. In order to operate, it would require the use of advanced technological systems that had not even been researched or developed in right. any meaningful way. But maybe that's the point. It's like, you know, we're just going to talk about it and tell the Soviets that the Americans actually, you know, have this technology, but act like you do. Many in the scientific community were not even sure if such technology was possible, with others suggesting that even if it was, it could be several decades before such a system would be ready. So yeah, what exactly no was going on? Did the president have inside knowledge into advanced secret later. technology that was almost ready for use? Or was the entire speech an elaborate hoax designed to bait the Soviet Union into massively increasing its military spending? as it desperately tried to keep pace with the United States by pouring billions into developing its own space-based missile shield, causing a new defensive arms race that would place additional pressure on the already struggling Soviet economy, forcing yeah. the Kremlin to the negotiating table to discuss slashing its nuclear arsenal, or perhaps even completely bankrupting the USSR and ending the Cold War in the process. Yeah, I mean, that, that essentially is what happens in the 1980s with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union's budget for its military um, was such a high percentage that they couldn't keep the local economies, you know, um, afloat that way. Because again, it was such a large part of their GDP was was this, and it did bankrupt. I mean, the Cold War basically bankrupted the Soviet Union. So what I want to see though is is there evidence 
that the Soviet Union took this seriously, this def the space defense network, um, and amped up their spending. Because that's where you have to say it, it actually, you know, had an effect or not. At the end of the Second World War, the devastated world was left divided into two opposing and competing blocks. On one side was the capitalist West, consisting primarily of the USA and its NATO allies, while on the other was the communist East, made up of the Soviet-led Warsaw Pact. Right. With the USSR and USA now the two sole superpowers in the world, both blocs sought to outdo one another by developing sure, ever more vast on. and technologically superior militaries. However, this expensive arms race had brought into existence thousands of nuclear missiles that had the potential to effectively end human civilization. Yeah. Or uh, this late in the Cold War by the 80s, the Soviets actually had more uh, atomic weapons than the Americans did. They had, uh, had more, but again, you were still talking about numbers because it was in the thousands for both sides. Way more than you would ever need to. And the Soviets definitely overproduced those weapons because it came, again, it was more than you would ever need, plus the amount of money that was required from your economy to, to keep up that kind of production was not something the Soviets could keep up. Altogether, should a third world war break out between the two sides, Kiniatol. what became known- That's when you're getting hydrogen weapons, by the way, which in the 50s became the, just to go back, um, away from the atomic splitting of an atom, like you saw in weapons on Japan in World War II, and then you get the fusing of atoms in these hydrogen bombs that were way, way, way bigger in their yields, and you saw uh, tests like this out of the Pacific that the Americans were doing, and these bombs were just unbelievable. Together, should a third world war break out between the two sides? What became known as the Cold War engulfed the world, as the two blocs fought an economic, cultural, and scientific war against one another, occasionally even fighting indirectly sure. on the battlefield via proxy wars, yet fearfully Korea, engaging Vietnam. each other directly, the peace was kept through the doctrine of mutually assured destruction which was a guarantee to wipe each other off the face of the planet should either country decide to launch a nuclear first strike against the other. And this was the general feeling by the public was, you know, the general public and people around the world knew that there was so many atomic bombs in existence that if somebody used one, then they would be used in incredible retaliation. Thus, they would just use all of them pretty much and that basically the planet would be destructive, be destructive. So this idea that if one uses it, then every, the other is going to use it and use pretty much all of them. So it's mutually assured destruction because, you know, even if uh, uh, they have so many that even if some of them don't hit their targets or whatever, it's still enough to do incredible amount of damage. And this was what people were very worried about and thought was a very real threat that this was not just a possibility, but that it was going to happen at some time. That's why you saw, you know, the hysteria and things like the Cuban Missile Crisis or just the Cold War hysteria in general where they were uh, teaching people all about what to do when an atomic bomb happens, duck and cover stuff, uh, public bomb shelters and personal bomb shelters. People felt it was a very real thing. And then, you know, after, after atomic bombs were used in Japan in World War II, people thought that this was going to be the norm for battles, that large armies of potentially millions and stuff like it used to be those are a thing of the past and this is how war is now going to be so um but the on the counter argument of that is you know with all this potential for destruction have the incredible amount of nukes that are in existence made the world more peaceful because it's a deterrent for people to fight large-scale wars anymore because of the threat of nuclear annihilation so it's an interesting concept you can you can kind of uh, talk about and you can put a comment down if you if you think nukes are actually making the world safer by a deterrent for large-scale wars let me know what you think again below. such a backdrop it's no surprise that obtaining a defense system that could shoot down enemy missiles would be the holy grail for the military forcing the side that lacks such a defense to the bargaining table to agree to a dramatic decrease in conventional and nuclear forces, Carter. as their nuclear deterrent would now be all but worthless. Such a system could prevent a nuclear doomsday, avert a world war, and win the Cold War for whichever Berlin. side was able to develop it first, so undoubtedly both blocs were actively considering ways in which such a defense might be created. The idea of ballistic missile defense was nothing new, with the US Army considering such systems as far back as World War II, sure. when serious efforts were made to come up with a way to intercept yeah. German V-2 rockets. I mean, either way, if you're doing surface-to-air or air-to-air, you're still talking about a technology that's incredibly, uh, <laughs> I don't know, high-end to, to be able to have something that can actually intercept another rocket that way accurately. 
And people talk about, you know, you may shoot a bunch of them. And if someone shoots a bun bunch of nuclear weapons, you know, it doesn't take very many to get through your shielded network to make cataclysmic disaster. And that's what people know, too, is no defense system can be purely like 100% uh, foolproof, especially when you compare it with how many thousands of nuclear weapons actually existed. It just takes a few to get through to have almost utter annihilation. Before they could hit their targets. However, as the flight time of the V-2 was so short, it was deemed to be impractical to shoot them down, as forwarding the necessary information through command and control networks yeah. to the missile batteries that would attack them would simply take too long, with the V-2 hitting its target long before it could be destroyed. Yet despite modern longer range missiles flying much faster than the V-2, the longer distances that they had to travel meant that they were in the air for long enough and at high enough altitudes for detection and destruction to be a very real possibility. Sure. Serious efforts were made to come up with a way to create a nationwide defensive system against yeah. ICBMs, yet with the technology- Intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. Like they're saying there, it's the guidance systems that are so incredible because you'd have to make such precise corrections uh, to the rockets like this uh, to be able to, again, enter something, intercept something going so fast and is essentially very small like these rockets actually are. She required simply not existing yet, and with the Soviets capable of churning out thousands of missiles, as well as using thousands more yeah, cheaper in decoy missiles. The United States definitely had a lot more, as you see, in the 60s with the uh, amount of uh, nuclear warheads. But then you see the United States kind of goes down with the production of them. But then in the 80s, you see the Soviet Union, it kind of skyrockets there. Um, so you see kind of a rebirth, like in the 60s, early 60s there, as you can see, that was really when uh, the people thought the closest threat to a nuclear war was, like with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, but you can see after that, the United States started to scale down. And then the Soviet Union started to scale up, as you saw. And then in the 80s and 90s, interesting that you find this, uh, there, there it goes in line, the amount of nuclear warheads they have um, at their peak was about the same time that the Soviet Union collapsed in the late, late 80s and into the early 90s. So it kind of coincides uh, this production. So maybe they're related, right? Missiles to fool such a system. It was estimated that such a program would mean having to spend $20 on defense for every $1 the Soviets spent on offense, making it impractical from an economic standpoint. Especially with Yet how despite much such running. huge technological and economic barriers existing, it remained both sides' worst nightmare that the other might somehow, against the odds, come up with a way to render their opponents' nuclear arsenals obsolete, leaving them wide open to a nuclear first strike. With fears in the US stoked to ever greater heights, in the early 1980s when Edward Teller, the so-called father of the hydrogen bomb, announced that the USSR was behaving ever more boldly on the world stage due to their development of new space-based weapons, mm. despite little evidence suggesting that such research was being carried out. Mm. His motivations for the announcement instead being to try and obtain funding for his latest nuclear weapon project by attempting to stoke fears of a perceived technology gap. I mean, well, that's the most powerful thing is definitely if you can get them to fear, if you can get your population to fear the other, Okay, whether it's a super credible threat or not, you're going to then have, uh, you're more likely to be able to get the support to defend against some uh, such threats. Lord Reagan's election in 1981 coincided with perhaps the height of these fears, and while on a presidential visit to the NORAD command base at Cheyenne Mountain Complex, he was said to have been deeply disturbed by the realization that the US military could track enemy missiles with a great level of detail, but could do nothing to stop them. And while understanding the effectiveness of the policy of mutually assured destruction, he found it morally and politically distasteful. This feeling of helplessness, coupled with the long-standing idea that a missile defense system might be possible, combined to create the impetus for the formation of the Strategic Defense Initiative, the president requesting that work begin on utilizing emerging technologies to come up with a missile shield that would use ground and space-based weapons to track, intercept, and destroy Soviet ballistic missiles. You can tell, you know, with Reagan, Reagan definitely was on a platform going right into his, his candidacy in 1980, that he was going to take a much stronger stance against the Soviet Union than what was going on in the 1970s, really, and especially since... Uh, kind of the, the, the failures the U.S. had in the Vietnam War. But that was a big thing. He was hardcore, like, we are going to basically end this thing and pressure the Soviet Union to end this stuff. And that's why you see him, maybe more than presidents in the past, 
more willing to entertain these types of ideas, even if they're completely outlandish, like this laser defense system. Before they could hit US or allied territory, effectively replacing the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, which was seen as little more than a suicide pact. On the 23rd of March, 1983, President Reagan delivered his Star Wars speech, announcing to a surprised world that plans were in motion to build a defense system that might make the threat of nuclear weapons a thing of the past. And, and maybe the Star Wars movies, because again, they were there at their height here in the early 80s, that people were like more likely to think it's possible. It's like, they did it in the movies, they have this kind of stuff in the movies, we can't be that far off, right? Just a year later, the SDI was set up, which reviewed a whole host of concepts for missile defense systems, many of which relied on uninvented, futuristic technology, which was widely seen as either unfeasible or simply nothing more than a fantasy. But just An assortment of fantastical weapons were proposed, including X-ray lasers powered by nuclear explosions, space-based <laughs> particle beams, plasma weapons, hypervelocity railguns, and a system of lasers that could be relayed via mirrors orbiting the Earth. <laughs> However, many of the proposed ideas it's, it's simply laughable, did not work much. or utilize technology that was several decades away from even reaching a prototype stage. Yeah. In 1986, the American Physical Society, the world's second largest organization of physicists, released a report on the proposals which concluded that none of them were anywhere near ready for deployment, yeah. with some of the concepts requiring levels of energy to be improved by over a million compared yeah. to what was currently possible. While other I'm glad that like the actual scientists were like, no, this is, we're not even close, man. You know what you should probably do is probably try some more diplomacy to end this war rather than just intimidate through to, uh, a, a, an economic expenditure that we can't handle to build technologies that aren't even close to being able to exist. This was simply dismissed as being impossible. Yet the criticisms did not end there, with many condemning the SDI for threatening to destabilize the world by starting a new arms race or even encouraging the Soviets to launch a first strike before the US was able to put the defense True. shield into active operation. That's a good point. Well, that they're like, the Soviets are going to be like, holy crap, we better stop this now because, you know, they're going to have this system that could potentially take us down. Uh, we better show it now. But you'd, you'd have to think the rest of the world was freaking out of this too. The United States are going to have some global space network of lasers. That sounds like they could take over the planet, you know what I mean? And start, I don't know, blasting lasers down on any country that they want. I'm sure the rest of the world would be freaking out, not like this very much at all. While others not simply pointed Americans to the absurd that. costs involved and such a system's vulnerability to being completely overwhelmed by the use of thousands of decoy missiles in the event of a nuclear attack. Yet such glaring weaknesses must have been noted by US leaders, leading many to point to the strong like likelihood like that it was all jar. just an elaborate hoax Jelly designed to bankrupt the Soviets by forcing them to pour billions of dollars into dead-end research as they tried to come up with a defense shield of their own, placing unbearable stress on a society already racked by economic, political, and ethnic tensions. Such deceptions were common These throughout were the tough. I mean, economically too, something you gotta add in this is all this spending on nuclear weapons, but then co combine that with what a lot of people call uh, the Soviet Union's Vietnam, which was uh, their disastrous war in Afghanistan, which they end up losing, which um, really set them back as well, just like the, the uh, Vietnam War did for the United States. War, as each side tried to mislead and confuse the enemy over the decades-long game for global supremacy. However, another view takes a far more sinister edge with some journalists reporting that tests on missile defense systems were falsified to make them seem more promising than they really were. By the way, I want to, this, this photo is really famous. This is um, a, a picture, I think, from the Trinity test, which is the first atomic bomb test that happened in July of 1945 out of New Mexico. And it's a picture of the, the atomic bomb test um, going off in the first like millisecond or something. Um, so you could see, I don't know if you can tell, but this is like the explosion, but if you can tell on the very bottom, it might be hard to see in this screen, but the tower, the, the bomb was put on a tower, so it was up in the air a little bit, and you can actually still see the tower, and when you look at after photos, there's a, just tiny bits of molten iron or whatever they, they built that tower out of, but this is, yeah, from the, the first picture that you get of one, uh, but it's within like a millisecond, right, I mean, almost as close as you can get to at the exact moment of detonation. In an effort to defraud Congress and the American people out of billions of dollars, as government departments hungry for increased budgets, 
inflated the threat the Soviets posed to gain an estimated $30 billion, which was estimated to have been spent on SDI-related projects. Yet despite such glaring problems with the program being obvious to anyone with an ounce of technical expertise, the President's television announcement could not simply be ignored by the Soviets, who had to consider the possibility that somehow the US had come up with such incredible technology. The Soviets did indeed begin work on their own defense shield, spending an unknown amount of resources on the project, what which must have been considerable, know. and a figure they could ill afford. And estimates suggest that up to 70% of their propaganda worldwide was directed towards attacking the SDI, while the Central Committee was practically overwhelmed by the number of cables coming through their office each day dealing with missile defense related matters. President Reagan's announcement threatening to drown Moscow in a flood of information. If the Star Wars program was indeed a hoax, it's difficult to assess exactly how effective it was in contributing towards the end of the Cold War, and contradictory statements exist from Soviet officials of the time, commenting on what impact it had on the USSR. In the years after the end of the Cold War, a former Soviet foreign minister said that the SDI had a decisive influence on Soviet policies that accelerated the end of the Cold War. A Russian deputy foreign minister told ABC News that the Soviet Union fell precisely because it could not afford Star Wars and the arms race against the West, while the former chairman of the Supreme Soviet Foreign Relations Committee stated that the SDI accelerated the fall of the USSR by about five years. Oh, However, wow. Okay, so that's what I was hoping for to hear from this was what's the actual evidence that this had an impact because you know it never becomes close to being an actual reality like having this defense system but um if it got them the soviets amped up at their spending and their worry and if that's true i mean five years accelerated the end of the cold war by five years that does seem like a lot um a lot more than you'd think so i don't know i want to know like the data what was actually changed that accelerated it. Many other former officials have stated that the SDI had little to no effect on Soviet policy. It is likely that the announcement goaded the Soviets into arms negotiations, Reagan as leaders in the Kremlin realized that should the SDI be genuine, they lacked the financial resources to compete on such an advanced technological level. However, it's probable Final that the missile the defense Union. shield plans made little real difference to the inevitable series of events that would result in the dissolution of the USSR. The Soviet Union's economy was already in dire straits, resulting in frequent food and consumer goods shortages, mm -hmm. with breadlines becoming a depressing part of daily life, while many Soviet citizens lacked access to basic needs that were commonplace in the capitalist West. Right. This caused immense levels of resentment amongst the average man on the street towards the Communist Party elite, who were seen as living extravagant and privileged Lenin. lives, shielded from the harsh realities of life by their political positions, and the squandering of immense oil wealth on the arms race with NATO, coupled with plummeting oil prices, forced the USSR to loosen its expensive military grip on right. Eastern Europe, resulting in the flourishing of independence movements, yeah. which would eventually lead to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Hey. Yeah, I mean, start, you know, you're starting in the 80s there, you started to see these satellite states of the Soviet Union break off and successfully where an earlier on the Soviet Union was able to militarily keep these satellite states in check um, they had lost that ability again they with their failures in Afghanistan and then the economic failures that were going on and just the increased like they said res uh, resentment of the people wanting change there in the 80s um, you're starting to see the little pieces of the Soviet Union are coming you know to an end there hastening the collapse of the Soviet Empire an unsuccessful coup by Communist Party hardliners in August 1991 put the final nail in the Soviet coffin, emboldening democratic forces in the country and leading to the state officially ceasing to exist on December 26, 1991. Just two years later, the SDI officially ended, its purpose now seemingly redundant. However, the idea of creating a missile shield lives on today, with many spin-offs of the plan still continued. As the US looks to secure its interests against growing threats from terrorists and rogue states around the world, while the prospect of a second Cold War with an emergent Russia seems to be a very real possibility. The fears that gave birth to the unusual Star Wars speech all those years ago, once again gripping policymakers at the highest levels of government. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe to see lots more, and I hope to see you again soon. All right, that that uh, video gave me a lot to think about. They, 
at least answered my my thing though, which was uh, what would be the kind of answered what would be the evidence of this potentially being um, something that that really impacted the end of the Cold War. And I really I, I really I guess just what you you got out of it was that official saying that that was for, you know on the inside that it was uh, speeding up a lot of their maybe their spending and um, got them very not obsessed with the whole like defense system the United States was bringing on, but, but definitely uh, made impacts on how they were spending and how they were um, treating things. Even though, again, I, th- I would think that even on the Soviet side, that any, any person with any technological background would understand that what the United States was sitting there proposing was not even close to, to happening. And that was probably though, I mean, that's probably the impact though, that, that why uh, President Reagan was making these public speeches that even if it wasn't going to be anywhere close to reality, that it would get to the Soviet side because they would see these broadcasts and, you know, didn't want to just have to rely on calling the Americans bluff. So um, now one question I would ask, though, is even without, or I'd, I'd question I'd answer, even without this proposal of this, again, laser space defense system, would the Cold War still have had the same result? And I, I think definitely, definitely. Um, with how things were going in the 1980s economically for them, the uh, the people clamoring for more sort of uh, freedoms and less of a grip um, on, on society. Um, when you get things like Glasnost and Perestroika, which were policies that were kind of limiting or, or uh, um, changing the, the tight bureaucracy of the Soviet Union, and then also lifting more censorship and getting more rights that way. Those things were happening, and already with the economic problems that the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was spending terribly when it comes to their economy uh, because of, you saw like that graph with how many atomic weapons were being developed in the 80s, which was totally absurd to try to go for that amount when economically they're already hurting and a failing war with um, Afghanistan and starting to lose control of their satellite states. Add up those things, that's going to have a far bigger impact than whatever decisions they were going to make to counter this defense system that the United States was going to make. So if it's, um, it is important though, if it did in fact, like that Soviet official said, made them act in a way that ends up being poor for them because it sped up in his words, sped up the end of the cold war by five years. If that's even partially like even halfway part of reality, you know what I mean? Um, then yeah, that does have an impact. So that's pretty cool. Now, was it a hoax, which is one of the questions maybe, Maybe, maybe there was never a serious, actual plan for this. Because it didn't sound like they even got to step one. They were still on step zero, which was just talking about it. Like, it seems like not a single concrete step was actually made to make this kind of absurd defense network. Um, Because you wouldn't even have anything close to that today. You know, it'd still be the same thing. It'd be decades and decades out. And then the the, the, um, benefit to cost ratio would not even be close. But anyways, um, if it was totally a just a hypothesized thing, brilliant, brilliant. You had nothing to lose, I mean, by, by promoting and talking about this potential plan. You have nothing to lose, um, only something to gain, which might be to get in the heads of your enemy or get them to change the way they talk about or make disagreements or get them to, to again, start making decisions that end up backfiring. So with that, pretty brilliant move there. But as far as I know, no real concrete steps ever really happened with this. So with that, I think that's a fascinating story. If you had not heard of that story, I think it's a pretty cool one. Look into that, um, the SDI and, and yeah, the whole Star Wars thing. It's pretty fascinating. When I used to teach U.S. history, that was always kind of something fun to, to talk about. It's like during the height of Star Wars, the movie series, you have this Star Wars idea, which, again, seemed like science fiction, but, you know, maybe had some at least some effect on the Cold War and, and getting the, the Soviet Union to actually worry about it. All right. Well, that was a great video. Thank you, patrons, uh, for selecting that video. If that's something you'd like to be involved in, um, if you become a Patreon member, there's a link down below. The membership started a dollar a month. Um, that will get you access to the weekly polls and uh, so you can you can uh, have a little more influence on what comes on this channel. If you want some higher tiers, there are some that get you some fun uh, history merch. But like I said it before, if you're into gaming, I'm definitely going to be playing Call of Duty uh, Cold War. 
and I was playing the beta actually last night. If you're watching this around the this uh, the time that this came out, um, definitely sub to my gaming channel, Mr. Terry Gaming on YouTube, or over on Twitch, Mr. Terry History. There's links down below if you want to get involved in that. Also, get involved in our dis Discord community. We got a lot of people that love to talk history over there, and links to a bunch of other stuff uh, that's fun down below. Okay, but make sure you support the original video. That link's down there, and uh, we'll go ahead and see you next time. Bye.